Welcome to Word Up Wednesday. I'm Pastor Daniels. Thank you so much for joining me here today on Word Up Wednesday. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice. Let's be glad in this day. I'm telling you, I am so excited about today's Word Up Wednesday session. You just don't really know. Wow, how excited I am. This past Sunday, we had an awesome Easter Resurrection Sunday service. I'm telling you, the Lord met us here. And, and if you know what I'm talking about, it's nailed to the cross. You need to say that, say it's nailed to the cross. I'm going to tell you, God gave us a word. We had a wonderful time of worship. Our music ministry did a phenomenal job uh, with some of the songs. And when I say with some of the songs, the songs that, that I requested that they sing, and they did a great job ministering those songs. The presence of the Lord was here. Uh, people received Jesus. People's lives were transformed. We thank God for our wonderful congregation here at Cornerstone Christian Center Church. Listen, I need you to share this broadcast with someone. Let them know that Word Up Wednesday is on. Let them know I'm getting ready to teach the Word of God and they don't want to miss it. So go ahead, share that. Share with your contacts. Share it uh, with all your family, your friends. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you share it and make sure you also hit the like button. It does help for the video uh, to go out to other people who are not who are not subscribed to our channel, but it will be in front of their eyes and they could see it. They could get in on the word of God. Glory be to God. Hello, everybody. How y'all doing? Glory be to God. That's right. It's nailed. It's nailed to the cross. That's right. Glory be to God. Uh, all of our depression, all of our oppression, sin, sickness, disease, transgressions, iniquities, generational curses, nail, nail. You need to say it's nail to y'all going to have me preaching uh, Resurrection Sunday service today. But no, I just want to remind you that some of the things that we face, we need to remind the devil that is nailed to the cross. Glory be to God. Well, I'm ready to get to the word of God. I know you're ready to hear. Come on, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. It is the day that you've made and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. It's come time for us to hear your word. We declare our hearts good ground to receive that word. I pray for everyone that's watching online. I thank you, Father, for peace being in their home, peace being on their job, peace being in their car, wherever they go, that your peace prevails in their life. I thank you, Father, for keeping them totally protected with the angel of the Lord being encamped around about them in the name of Jesus. I thank you that we have ears to hear and a heart to understand. And I thank you for anointing me to teach. It's in Jesus name that I pray Let everybody say amen. Glory be to God. Well, you know, uh, prior to Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we've been dealing with the peace of God and how we have the peace of God. If you are born again, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus says he's left us his peace. Look at John chapter 14. John, the gospel according to John chapter number 14, verse number 27. And Jesus tells us uh, what he has left for us to take advantage of. John 14, verse 27 says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So Jesus lets us know clearly that we have, if we're born again, we have his peace on the inside of us. It's on the inside of us and it's ready to assist us. It's ready to enable us. The peace of God is a spiritual force and it will protect you. Uh, we'll read that later in Philippians, but it will protect you. It'll keep your heart and your mind by Christ Jesus. But we have to know how to access it so that we could take advantage of the peace of God that we have on the inside of us. And if you've been with us, you know how to do that. We, we went over that teaching, but I, I, I want to give you some keys today to seeing that peace not only manifest, but actually you gain the full potential of that peace on the inside of you. Go to Philippians chapter four, Philippians chapter four, because we're going to talk about two primary issues here that deal with the, the, the measure of the peace that, that you experience. Because I believe 
that uh, because he's, he's, he's given us his peace and we have it, that sometimes we, are, uh, we can be robbed of taking advantage of the full measure of that peace. And so we want to make sure that we're always positioned to take advantage of the full measure of peace that Jesus has left us. Uh, Philippians chapter four, Philippians chapter four, verse number six. Look what it says. Verse number six says this. Be careful or, you know, that means anxious. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, uh huh, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's keep going. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me have flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The verse that I want you to focus on is verse number 11. So let's read verse 11 again. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And, and, and really, that is a part of the topic that we're going to deal with today, because I believe contentment is the anchor to the peace of God. Contentment is the anchor of the peace of God. Now, many, many people misunderstand what true contentment is. They think it's being unmotivated or uh, to move forward or receiving God's best in their life. Some people think that being content means living a non prosperous life. Neither of these is true. Then there are also those who understand the message of prosperity, but can't fit their definition of contentment in with their desires. Therefore, they skip over this verse like it doesn't even exist. If we do that, we run the risk of becoming competitive and trying to be better than the next person. This is the world standard and their definition of self-worth. Then we also have those who preach God never promised to give you your desires as they preach their version of contentment. But the Bible says this. The Bible is clear. Psalm 37 verse number four says, delight thyself also in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he will Give you the desire. So if 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 getting your desires is contradictory to being content, then that that verse would not be in the Bible. Matter of fact, Mark chapter 11, verse number 24, Mark chapter 11, verse number 24 says this. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So the Bible is clear that that God wants you. He wants you to pray about your desires so that you can receive them. Delight thyself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. So, yes, you, you can have desires, but that has to be in connection with also being content at the same time. So contentment then has nothing to do with things. Glory to God. 
<laughs> it has nothing to do with your desires being met. Contentment is the undisturbed internal peace and satisfaction that comes from a vibrant relationship with God and is not linked to the acquisition of power or things. It is the inner peace we possess while we pursue the promises of God. So now if, if, if we look at if we look at it again with that definition, look at Philippians four, verse number six. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. He's telling you to pray about it. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Verse eight, he tells you what to think on. Verse nine, he says, those things which you both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice greatly. Right. Then verse 11, he says, not that I speak in respect of want. I'm not trying to get something from you, for I have learned. That's key. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. In other words, no matter what's going on in my life, no matter what circumstance there is, no matter what situation there is, I'm not going to allow adversity or obstacles or challenges or things or things that I have or things that I don't have uh, or who I who, who, who people think I am. I'm not going to let any of that disturb my peace. Content literally means to be self-sufficient or totally independent of anyone or anything to bring satisfaction. And see, that's the key. Let me tell you something. I just want to be real flat out. Are y'all with me? If y'all with me, say, say amen. <laughs> Listen, if you want contentment, if you want to be content, you want to learn, 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 because you're not born with contentment. You have to learn how to be content. If you want to learn how to be content, you cannot place your self-worth or your value in the things you possess. Uh, the theologian Mar Marvin Vincent says that a person should be able to resist the shock of circumstance. So that means my satisfaction does not come from people. It does not come from things, but it comes from God himself. My satisfaction comes from pleasing God. <laughs> uh, W.E. Vine says that to be content is to be possessed of sufficient strength to be strong, to be enough for a thing. Hence, to defend and ward off. In other words, when you are content, it is a defense mechanism in your emotional realm. So it will ward off any attack. Glory be to God. When you as a believer possess contentment, you have sufficient strength to defend and ward off any circumstance. Look at this. Look at this in Hebrews. I think this is very interesting. In Hebrews, the 13th chapter in the fifth verse, we're going to read it from the Amplified. Hebrews 13 and five. And, and let's let's read it in King James first. Let's read it in King James first and then let's read it in the Amplified. Uh, Hebrews 13, five. Let your conversation. OK, now I got to stop and teach. Because that word conversation there, it's not just talking about the words that you speak or how you communicate. It's really talking about your lifestyle. Let your conversation be without covetousness huh? and be content with such things as ye have. For he have said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That, 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 that is so important. He's not saying you don't desire better. You don't want better. But he's saying Understand that God's presence is more important than anything you could ever have. Let me tell you something. He says, don't be covetousness. Don't be covetous. So covetousness is the very opposite of contentment. Covetousness breeds competitive jealousy. If we're content, we won't be tempted to be competitive with our brothers and our sisters. Oh, OK, let me put it like this. And let's go ahead and read this. I better go ahead and follow my notes. 
because uh, I, I, I'm getting so excited. I want to actually get to a point, but we have to lay this foundation first. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians. I didn't even read that in the Amplified, but that's OK. Second Corinthians chapter 10. I think y'all got it. If you got it. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Verse number 12. Powerful verse. You need to lock this one into memory. Second Corinthians 10 verse 12. King James Version. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Contentment is directly linked to the belief you have about yourself. If you believe that your value and your worth is based on people and things, you will never be content. Let me say that again. If you believe that your value and your worth is based on people and things, you will never be content. And if you are never content, you'll never operate in the full measure of the peace of God that Jesus has left on the inside of you. The peace of God and contentment go hand in hand. And if you measure yourself, <laughs> your value, your worth based on people or things you won't be content. Some people measure their value and their worth based on their education. Oh, I have a, a, a bachelor's degree or I have a master's degree or I have a doctorate degree or I have degrees in these areas. And, and yes, you, you successfully matriculated through that college, that university, whatever, and you have those degrees, you earn degrees, Praise the Lord. But that has nothing to do with your value and your worth. Some people measure their value and their worth on their occupation. I'm a nurse. I'm a teacher. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm, uh, I'm a physical therapist. I'm, uh, I'm a accountant. Um, I'm whatever, wh whatever it is. And they feel like uh, I'm in law enforcement. Uh, I'm a whatever, whatever the occupation is, it, it in their mind, it builds them up so that their value and their worth. Can I tell you something? In God's eye, the lawyer is no more valuable than the sanitation worker. The bus driver is just as valuable as the teacher in the classroom. See, when you start looking at the grand scope of things, and, and this is something that I, I, I've seen on, um, on the news recently, how there's a, a university, no, it wasn't on the news, I was watching a, 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 a television program, program about uh, uh, rehabbing homes. Uh, I don't want to give the name of the program or the or the network that it was on, but it, it, it's a couple. They, they rehab homes in their hometown and they rehab homes and, and they went to the college that they both attended. And the college said that they're now building a whole school, a whole institute that has to deal with carpentry and plumbing and electrical work because they found out that there are so many people who have valuable skills that they've learned outside of college and they feel like they're lesser because they don't have the college degree and they're trying to incorporate that because they're saying, hey, look, everybody's path is not through the college, but the college can provide this for you. And, and so they built a whole school on, on basically construction skills, on learning how to rebuild things and do it properly because with, 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 without, <laughs> without somebody with construction skills, we would not have this wonderful facility. So, and what I'm trying to get across to you is that your value and your worth is not based upon your occupation. It's not based upon how much money you have in the bank. It's not based upon your pedigree, uh, uh, who your mother and your father is. It's not based upon what school you went to or didn't go to. God loves you. Oh, glory to God. God loves you 
so much that he knows the number of hair that's on your head. No, each hair has a number. <laughs> Glory to God. And he places more value and more worth on your life than you could ever imagine. He placed so much value and worth on your life that he sent Jesus to the cross to die for your sins. Seemed like I'm still at Resurrection Sunday, y'all. <laughs> he placed that much value. So you have intrinsic value and worth on the inside of you. But if you believe you need these things, you'll never be content because you will always run up on someone who has more. And now you're trying to compete. And now you're comparing. You have to get to the place where you are content. You are content with who God created you to be. Not what he created you to do, what he created you to be, who you are. Glory be to God. See, if you never believe, if you believe that your value, your worth is based on people and things, you will never be content. But you can possess contentment when you understand that your value and your worth are not predicated on the things you possess. Let me, let me put it. Let me put it like this. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've seen in my life, I, I've seen people place their value and their worth on, on, on the things that they possess. I've seen people say, you can tell the measure of a man by the car he drives. And that's not, that's just not true. That's, that's just not true. I, I, my value and my worth is not based upon the vehicle I drive because God still valued me and God still had a whole lot of worth on the inside of me when in 1992 I was driving a 1972 and sometimes the air condition would go out. That was just my situation at the moment that had nothing to do with my value and my worth. <laughs> See, we, we cannot be like the world. There's a saying in the world that he who dies with the most things wins. That's false. He who dies in the Lord wins. See, see, our relationship with Jesus Christ has to mean more to us than anything else if we're going to learn how to be content. Now, being content does not mean you don't take care of your responsibilities. Being content does not mean you sit back and just let things come. Well, K sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. No, 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 no. You still fight the good fight of faith. You still pray. You still sow your seed. You still go out and do what you need to do. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he should not eat. You're still productive. You're productive for your family. You're productive for society. You're productive for your community. You're productive for your church. You still do the things you need to do. It's just that you've learned how to be content. I'm not going to let the absence of a thing disturb my peace. I'm not going to let the acquisition of a thing <laughs> increase my peace. Because truth be told, listen, <laughs> those things can come and go. You must learn how to be content so that you will be stable and anchored in the peace of God. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Contentment is a big deal. Contentment is a big deal because if you don't learn how to be content, you open the door for the devil to come in. Let me explain it like this. Are y'all still with me? If you're still with me, say amen. <laughs> Somebody says competition is exhausting. It is. It is because you're always measuring somebody, looking at someone, seeing what they got. What they got? Oh, I can go get that. Really? Maybe it's not time. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't even have it anyway. Really? You know, I, I have people in my neighborhood, when, when, when I see them get something new, I applaud. I don't know what they have to do to get what they got. I'm not, I don't see what's behind the scene. But if, if I see somebody look like they're progressing, I know how to applaud. 
Praise the Lord. Because I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. Pastor T and I, we went through some difficult times together. Thank God it was together. We went through some difficult times together. But at every stage, every obstacle, every adversity, we did not measure ourselves based upon the situation. No. We knew all things work together for our good. Glory be to God. Matthew chapter 13. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to turn a corner. If you're ready to turn a corner, put your seatbelt on. Everybody put your seatbelt on. Matthew chapter 13. Verse number 18. Let's go here. And I want to connect these two. I, I spent, spent so much time <clears throat> dealing with this contentment, but I, it's, it's needed. It's needed because I believe I believe these last four years and you know what happened in 2020. And I believe that that sort of brought out this anxiety with inside of people. I've seen. Oh, my God. I've seen people seem like they lose their contentment because they thought they lost some time. Not knowing that God will restore. I'm preaching to somebody right now that you are exactly what I just said. You thought because of what you went through in 2020 and 2021 that you've lost too much time and it's time for you to make it. But God has a word for you that he will restore to you the years that the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar and the palmer worm have eaten from your life. He is going to restore. He's going to make it up to you. But that's why you got to be content. Glory be to God. Matthew 13. Let's keep moving. Glory be to God. If you receive that, say amen. Matthew 13, verse number 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which is sown in his heart. This is he which is received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it. But he hath no root in himself, but dureth or endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word by and by, he is offended. He is offended because of the word by and by. He is offended when you are not content. You open up the door for becoming offended. Offense can come in. When you're not content because you're, you're competing and you're seeing this and you're seeing it. You're always looking at situations and circumstances and you're comparing yourself amongst yourself and you're looking at everything else and you're striving and because you're not content. You keep doing it. And then when somebody gets something, you can actually get offended that somebody else is progressing. To be offended is to displease, to make angry, to cause resentful irritation or displeasure. This describes an attitude or an emotion or a feeling offended. I am emotionally hurt. You could be offended. Somebody hurt you. I am emotionally hurt and wounded so deep that it's difficult for me to recover and get over it. Let me put it this way. <laughs> Being offended. Is really. The inability to forgive someone who has hurt you. Being offended is more than an attitude. It's more than an emotion or a hurt feeling. It is a trap. The word offense in the Greek is the word scandalizo. Scandalizo. We get the word scandalized in English. Usually that is what the offended person does is scandalizes the offender's reputation. Scandalizo means to entrap or to trip up. 
to put a snare or stumbling block in the way. Ah, it's that piece of wood in a trap or a pit that causes an animal to fall into the trap or the pit. By implication, it is the thing that causes one to be snared and traps the soul, then entices to sin. The enemy wants to trap you. If, if he cannot discourage, hear me, if he cannot discourage you from external sources with your situation and your circumstance, then he'll work on the inside in the arena of your soul. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect and your imaginations. It is in the arena of the mind, the will and the emotions that the enemy wants to trap you. It's a spirit from the devil. It is a divisionary spirit which comes to divide and separate believers. It's a trap to get you off course. Hmm. Someone, it, it could be a result of huh, a hurt that someone caused or a perceived hurt. I, I've, I've, I've had people get offended over some silly things. Silly things. I buy something nice for my wife, like uh, a pair of shoes or a handbag, and then they get offended. How does, let me tell you something. What somebody has should not offend you. I, I, I've seen people since 2020, 2021, because Pastor T and I made a certain decision about a certain vaccine and they got offended. They actually left the church because of a vaccine that they didn't receive. I received it and they were offended. Why? Why? Why, why did you let the devil use something that didn't even happen to you cause you to be offended? It's a trap. And because you're, offense, you're offended, you don't hear when I preach. And because you don't hear, then you won't have, be strengthened by the word to resist the devil when he comes. And that's exactly what he wants. He does not want you to hear the word so that you could be strengthened. So he, elect, he allows the or, or you actually allow the offense to take place. He sows the seed for the offense. Look what they got. And then you, you, you take it. It's a trap. It is a trap. Proverbs 18. Are y'all getting this or what? <laughs> Look like y'all having your own Bible study. Proverbs 18. <laughs> Let's see what verse we're going to. Verse 19. I got to calm myself down because I see this linkage here. If you're not content, you open the door to an offense. And if you're offended, you've just entered into the trap of Satan. Proverbs 18, mm, mm, mm. verse 19, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. The offense causes one to erect this wall within your soul so that you cannot receive. You don't want to give anything to the one who offended you if they really offended you. And you don't want to receive anything from the one that you offended by if they even offended you. And sometimes the offense happens. You, you didn't even let the person know that they offended you. <laughs> Let me tell you something. So now the Bible says this. It says out of the abundance of the heart are the issues of life. 
The issues of life, anything you cause to happen in life, it flows from your heart. But when you are offended, you put up these bars. Uh, Proverbs 18, verse 19, the bar, the contentions are like the bars of a castle. So you put up these bars, you set up this wall around your heart. Nothing's coming in, nothing's going out. No word in, no manifestation out. Did you catch it? The offense itself is stopping you from receiving God's best in your life. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse number 10, am I getting too excited, y'all, or what? Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse number 10, he says, the thief, put it up, please. John chapter 10, verse, I know I was quoting it, but let's, thank you so much. The thief cometh not, this is the reason why, but for two. So the thief comes to steal and kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. That's why he left us his peace so that we could have the abundant life so that we won't be offended. We can be content, not be offended, because when the offense comes, it sets up a bar or castle around our heart. And now nothing in, nothing out and nothing in, nothing out. That means you cannot Receive the abundant life. Well, I hope y'all got that. If you're with me, say I'm with you, Pastor. <laughs> I need to go to a few more scriptures. Today may seem a little bit, a little bit longer than before, but we really need this in the body of Christ. I've seen too many people. I've, I've seen pastors offended at other pastors. I have no idea why. I'm not talking about, you know, <laughs> somebody's preaching heresy. I'm talking about they just offended that the other pastor is doing something they're not doing and, and, and they're offended. If you stick to your assignment, you can be content. <laughs> if you stick to your assignment, you can be content. Now. Pastor, why are you preaching this? Because I do believe we're in the last days. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Then I have to tell you how to make sure you're not. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Matthew 24, verse number three. Verse number three. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? So Jesus had told him, he said, look, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to come back. And then the end of the world is going to happen after that. And he gave him. And so they gave him three questions. And Jesus answered and said unto him, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. We're seeing that happen. It has happened in the past, but we're seeing it happen now. People saying, no, just keep moving. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. We're seeing that happen right now. See that ye be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So we're not at the end. For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. The, the increase, the increase of believers becoming offended is a sign that we're in the last days. It is a sign of the time. Let me tell you something. Let me just get, get right to it. So now, <laughs> how do I get the victory over being offended? Because I, I, need to, I, got, I need to give you the answer because something could have happened to you in your past. Maybe somebody, maybe somebody hurt you and they intended to hurt you. And you know and they know they intended to do it. But the devil used it so that you could be offended. 
Sometimes thinking things can happen and it could be your perception that this person intended to hurt me and they had no intention to hurt you. But by and by you are offended. Then it could be a situation where you saw somebody and you thought it was just wrong for them to have what they have and you are offended. I know some people in the world who who have this misconception about uh, 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 prosperity. They have this misconception. Listen, God wants you to prosper. God wants you to be in health even as your soul prospers but he wants you to be content. That, that is prosperity. <clears throat> Some people have this issue that they want, they want, if you are a believer, then you should be poor. I can't find that in the Bible. Paul said, we read it in, in Philippians 4, Paul said, I know how to abound, I know how to abase. In other words, I know how to live with a lot, I know how to live with a little. He said, I can do both. Then he says, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So he's not talking about whether I have things or I don't have things. Neither one is wrong. He says, but you don't place your value on those things. Are y'all with me? So offense could come through many ways. But how do you get the victory over it? Number one, write this down. Number one, identify that you're offended. I think one of the most <laughs> popular things I see happen in the body of Christ since I've been born again is that you can see when someone's offended, but they try to act like they're not offended. You ask them, everything all right? Yeah, everything all right. Everything all right. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm blessed, highly favored, on my way to my wealthy place, rooted in ground love. And they start quoting all this religious jargon. And you can tell by their actions, they are offended. I, I've, seen it, I've seen it happen in, 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 in this church. Well, for some reason, I don't know why, they get offended. And now they're not committed like they used to. They're not doing the things they used to do because they are offended. If you want to get the victory over this offense, you want to tear this wall down that's in your heart so that nothing comes in and nothing goes out, then you must identify that you're offended. Then number two, number two, number two. Did y'all put number one? Nobody typed in number one for me. Come on, number one, identify that you're offended. Number two, take responsibility for your med meditations on the injury. It's something you've been meditating on. They did this to me. I can't believe they did this. I can't believe this happened. And you're meditating. You're thinking on it. You're thinking on it. Philippians 4, 8 says, think on things that are true, that are lovely, that are honest, that are of good report. Think on these things. Don't meditate on the injury someone caused. And sometimes, and this is how you mature in Christ. When you know that someone has injured, has hurt you, they've done something wrong, and you say, you know what, I'm going to forgive that person. And when you first start saying, I'm going to forgive that person, it don't feel like you've ever forgiven them. Matter of fact, you, you, that's why you can't walk in your feelings. It don't feel like you've forgiven them. You say, I for, Father, I forgive them for the wrong that they've caused me, for the hurt that they've done, the damage they've done. I forgive them now in the name of Jesus. And, and it doesn't feel like a thing, but you keep saying it over and over. You keep confessing that you are forgiving them. And many times it will take an interaction with that person where you go and you meet them and you really embrace them. And then you sense in your heart, oh, my God, the animosity that I used to have is gone because you didn't meditate on the injury. You meditated on overcoming it. So you must take responsibility for your meditations on the injury. Number three, you must Repent. Number one, identify that you're offended. Yeah. Number two, take responsibility for your meditation. Number three, you must repent. Oh, my God. <laughs> Glory to God. This is so good. This is so good. If you know it's good, shout amen. I hear the crowd shouting amen. 
Psalm 51, David says, have mercy upon Psalm 51, verse one. David says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. He goes on to say verse seven. Well, verse six, I got to say this. Behold, thou desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me, verse seven, with hyssop and I shall be clean. I, I used to hear that in the Baptist church. And I had no idea what they were talking about. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He's saying, God, clean me up on the inside. There's something wrong. He totally repents. And so this is, you, you, Pastor, do I have to repent for what somebody else did? No, you repent for your thought of trying to get back at them and holding them hostage and holding a grudge. You repent of that. You repent of holding that grudge. I don't like what they did to me. Forgive them for it so that an offense won't develop because it will become a root of bitterness on the inside of you. Glory to God. So number one, you identify that you're offended. Number two, take responsibility for your meditation. Number three, repent. And then number four, plead the blood of Jesus over your conscience. Plead the blood of Jesus over your conscience that it may purge you from dead works. And that's how you get the victory over being offended. Remember, if you are offended, then the peace of God, you know, if you're offended, you won't be content. And if you're not content, the peace of God won't operate at its full measure in your life. You won't sense the peace of God operating at its full measure in your life. But when you can get the victory over offense and learn how to be content, you'll see God's peace operate like never before. Wow. Did you get something out of today's word? Whew, glory to God. I mean, there was a lot in there. There's a lot of power pack, but I know you can receive it because you're well able. And yes, <laughs> all of your depression, all of your oppression, all of your sin, all of your sickness, all of your disease, all of your transgressions, all of your iniquities, all of the generational curses, all of the afflictions, every demonic authority and power has been nailed to the cross. Glory be to God. And we're going to keep it there. We're not going to pick it back up in Jesus name. Glory be to God. Well, why don't you say this with me? Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken in my life. Glory to God. Make sure you're with us every Monday on the telephone for Power Mondays at 7 o'clock a.m. to 7.15 a.m. The number is 848-888-9494, 848-888-9494. Let me tell you, those 15 minutes of intercessory prayer will change your life. It'll change your perspective because we're praying and we're interceding for our country. We're interceding for our state. We're interceding for our community, for our church. We're interceding for members of our church. This is the time that we pray and we seek God's face together corporately. Glory be to God. I want to give you a passage. Let me see here. A passage that I did not quote, but I think you need to have it in your arsenal. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Yeah. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter nine. Because my last point, I was talking about pleading the blood of Jesus over your conscience. And I want to give you the scripture. Hebrews chapter nine, verse number 14. Hebrews chapter nine, verse number 14. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience? Now, um, do a little study real quick. You'll see that you could. Leave it up on the screen. 
how much more shall the blood of Christ? And then you see a comma and then it explains. It's a uh, it is a phrase or a statement in between those two commas that explains what the blood of Christ is and what it does. It says who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Jesus Christ offered himself without spot to God. So he's saying that this blood is pure. This blood has power. Hmm. Then it says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, comma, it explains it. Then it says, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What he's saying is the blood of Jesus has power to cleanse, purge, cleanse your conscience from dead works. That's why you plead the blood of Jesus over your conscience. And it works every single time. Glory to God. All right. Wow. Woo. I'm still I'm still teaching on that. Glory to God. I need to pause. I need to stop. Make sure you're here with us. this. Hey, this Sunday, this Sunday is first Sunday in April. Can you believe it already? The first Sunday in April. Make sure you're here with us. On this coming Sunday, it's Covenant Communion Sunday. So we'll par be partaking in communion together as a covenant family. Make sure you're here. We're going to welcome some people as new members of our church. You don't want to miss this coming Sunday. Well, it's offering time. It's time for us to return our tithes and give our offerings so we can advance God's kingdom in the earth. A tithe is 10 percent of your gross income. Offering is everything above that 10 percent level. And I am so excited that so many people participated in sowing a resurrection seed on this past Sunday, on Resurrection Sunday. And that's without any prompting. Uh, uh, it is a sacrificial seed. It is a sacred seed, but it will produce a harvest in your life. I am confident of that because anytime you offer a sacrifice unto God, God honors that sacrifice. And let me, can I tell you something? Everybody sacrifices at a different measure or a different level. A sacrifice is something that is unusual. A sacrifice is going beyond your initial expectation. And if you could take an amount, whatever that amount is, and, and you're accustomed to going out and you could spend that amount without thinking, then giving that very same amount is not a sacrifice. What is a sacrifice is going above and beyond that. And I'm so excited for those who offered that sacrifice because I know I stand in agreement for you receiving the maximum return on your seed sown into Cornerstone Christian Center Church. And I just want to express my gratitude and my thanks for those who know that Cornerstone is good ground. I pray for your harvest to come quickly in Jesus name. Now, are you ready to give? We made it easy for you to give. There are four ways to give, four ways to give. You can give online on our website, icornerstone.org. You can contact us directly. You can give by mail or you can use the text to give option, whichever option you decide to use. Go ahead and do that and honor God with your seat. Hold up your device with me and declare this. Say, Father, I thank you for this tithe or offering that I'm planting into your kingdom. Your word says it will come back. In good measure, press down, shaking together and running over in Jesus name. Wow. We had a full teaching today on Word Up Wednesday. I know, I know your life is going to be a whole lot better because we have learned. We're learning how to be content and we will not open the door to offense. Huh. That way we can experience the full measure of the peace of God on the inside of us. Go in peace, prosper and remember Jesus is Lord.